How did knights and monks stay fit during the Middle Ages? Today, we're going to look at several medieval exercises and fitness regimens from that time, used to build strength, health, and even increase resistance to plagues, as some claimed. In looking at these methods, one is struck by the obvious parallels to many modern practices such as kettlebell lifting and yoga. This is especially significant, as in recent years many modern people have begun to claim, across the internet, that medieval people didn't work out at all or need to worry about fitness because daily life back then was just so strenuous as to make it completely unnecessary. Authors from the period, however, stated the exact opposite. In 1308, in his remarkable treatise on fitness, the French-born Scottish physician Bernard Gordon wrote, quote, The work of carpenters, farmers, merchants, etc. is not a physical exercise, since we do not observe voluntary movement, speaking properly, but rather forced movement. Moreover, merchants, bourgeois, and their like walk a great deal for long periods and over long distances, but here too we are not dealing with a genuine physical exercise. In order to have this, one must walk at one's own initiative, without doing anything else, at a fast pace, until one feels tired and one's breathing has altered. It's important to note that fitness objectives today, mainly strength building and cardio, were not the same as back then. Hunching over a workbench or a field or stooping all day in a mine created physical problems and this very strain of labor made exercise desirable for the medieval peasantry. To those ends, sports, contests, and physical games were highly popular, as can be seen in a number of period images and first-hand accounts. These games increased suppleness, flexibility, and range of motion, which helped combat the unhealthy postures often required by manual labor. Festivals often included tumblers, acrobats, jumpers, and contortionists, who engaged in balancing feats and postures which would put to shame many yoga practitioners of today. Although such specialized feats were not ones that the common man or woman would take part in, it does show that impressive physical knowledge and skill did exist in medieval Europe. However, it was the monks of the Middle Ages who perhaps engaged in the most impressive and sophisticated forms of exercise, not for fun, but explicitly for health. In 1308, Bernard Gordon described an array of exercises to be practiced by the clergy in a cella or hall that had been converted into a gymnasium. He wrote, quote, In the room, there should be a stout rope full of knots hanging from the ceiling. The man should seize the rope with both hands and hold his body straight without touching the ground and hang that way for some time. Then, holding the rope and running with it for as far as possible, let him jump in the air, turning himself round and round and strutting fiercely about. Gordon then goes on to describe weight training exercises. In an expanded version published by the London priest John Mirfeld later in the century, quote, If this pastime does not please him, let him hold in his hands a stone, weighing 30 pounds, in which a ring has been fixed, and carry it about frequently from one part of his dwelling to another, or let him hold the same stone up in the air for a long time before setting it down, or lift it to his neck, or between his hands until he begins to tire. Notice that Gordon's hanging exercise and stone exercise would be known as isometric exercises today. Also, Gordon's description of a stone with an attached ring strongly resembles the Dinny stones created in Scotland in the 19th century, as well as ring weights used in Europe, forerunners of modern kettlebells. In fact, Gordon's stone exercises could be fairly replicated using a 30-pound kettlebell. Gordon describes another exercise as follows, quote, Another mode is for two people to sit on the ground, feet against each other, and for them both to hold one staff, and afterwards to see which of them can heave the other. Gordon also mentions breathing exercises, which involve holding one's breath and forcefully expelling it, which would not be out of place today in some Tai Chi and Pranayama practices. Much like their famous Chinese counterparts, the Shaolin monks, Medieval European clergy also engaged in martial exercises. Monks were featured in the first known European fencing treatise, the Walpurgis Manuscript 133, created around 1300 in Germany, which detailed a method of attack and defense with a sword and buckler, and even features a female combatant. During the 14th century, two additional treatises on swordsmanship were authored by the priests 
Hans Dubringer, and Johannes Lekuchner. Monk's fitness practices also extended to the bow. From the 1360s onward, a series of government ordinances and statutes ordered English men and boys to develop archery skills for the sake of national defense. However, from 1462, the infirmary garden at Westminster Abbey gave access to archery fields where monks, who were completely exempt from military service, could practice for their health during epidemics. Monks, it seems, were at the forefront of fitness practices throughout the Middle Ages. Part of the reason monks advocated exercise at the time was the belief that being physically fit could, to some degree, protect one from the plagues ravaging Europe. Although they didn't have an understanding of germ theory or immunity as we think of it today, either tradition or accumulated experience had given medieval people the idea that diet and outdoor exercise aided in combating disease. A letter sent to the merchant Francesco Marco Dattini during his stay in plague-ridden Bologna warned, quote, Let not the sun down behind the hill without your having gone out, or, if indeed you cannot, take before meals a little exercise to tire you. And the Benedictine monk John Lydgate, in his Dietary Doctrine for Pestilence, also warned readers to exercise, maintain a healthy diet, and breathe clean outdoor air. The importance of exercise was also emphasized by church leaders. During the 1400s, Pope Pius II advocated physical education for youth and mentioned a number of exercises, such as riding, climbing, swimming, shooting with a bow, and hurling the spear. He reportedly mentions in his work that Magister Johannes Kinderbach was the inventor of the exercise of throwing a wooden spear, which he calls part of German gymnastics. One of the earliest Europeans to advocate exercise with a stick for the development of health was Dr. Peter of Fagarola, a Spanish physician who wrote in the 1300s that, quote, if you cannot go outside your lodgings, either because the weather does not permit or it is raining, have in your room a big heavy stick like a sword and wield it now with one hand, now with the other, as in a scrimmage, until you are almost winded. This is a splendid exercise to warm one up and expel noxious vapors. Centuries later, Michael de Montagna also recounted how his father exercised with, quote, canes poured full of lead, with which they say he exercised his arms for throwing the bar or the stone, or in fencing. Physical exercises were also part of a knight's and warrior's training. Hans Talhofer, author of one of the most famous medieval European treatises on the martial arts, directed, quote, in your knightly practices, throwing and pushing stones, dancing and jumping, fencing and wrestling. A more specific example of physical training in the 1300s comes from the French knight Jean Lemaigre Bossicot, marshal during the reign of Charles VI. Bossicot outlines the following fitness regimen for a young knight. Quote, now cased in armor, he would practice leaping onto the back of a horse, anon, to accustom himself to become long-winded and enduring, he would walk and run long distances on foot, or he would practice striking numerous and forcible blows with a battle axe or a mallet. In order to accustom himself to the weight of his armor, he would turn somersaults whilst clad in a complete suit of mail, with the exception of his helmet, or would dance vigorously in a shirt of steel. He would place one hand on the saddle bow of a tall charger and the other on his neck and vault over him. He would climb up between two perpendicular walls that stood four or five feet asunder by the mere pressure of his arms and legs and would thus reach the top, even if it were as high as a tower, without resting either in the ascent or descent. When he was at home, he would practice with the other young esquires at lance throwing and other warlike exercises, and this continually. A medieval Celtic account of various exercises can be found in the Welsh manuscript M.S. Pennyarth 56, the earliest version which was set down circa 1500, but which described earlier practices, referred to as, quote, the 24 feats. Among these, said to, quote, improve swiftness of foot, dexterity of hand, and vigor and activity of body, included, quote, exercises of activity, the display of strength in hurling a stone or throwing a bar, running, leaping, swimming, wrestling, 
writing, which extended likewise to feats and chariots of war, as described by Caesar. Exercises of weapons, archery, shooting, and throwing the javelin, fencing with a sword and buckler, fencing with the two-handed sword, and playing with the quarterstaff. A man who avoided these activities was said to renounce all claims to the character of a warrior. In conclusion, perhaps the most neglected aspects of such exercise were the spiritual and emotional components. As London priest John Muirfield explained, exercise bestowed, quote, pure recreation of the soul and body when it is performed in the open, for then a man is exposed to the wholesome air, or bono airy, and he rejoices in gazing far and near, and upon the sky, the sea, and the green landscape, and he is therefore constrained to commend, to praise, and to magnify the Lord his God. Exercise, therefore, is good, since, in some measure, it unites a man to his creator. In his treatise on diet and exercise, Bernard Gordon, in 1308, also states, quote, Exercise is one of the higher and nobler things which can be applied to the human body in the rule of fitness and in the prolongation of life. However, though Gordon was himself a physician, he laments that other doctors and medical professionals of the period were not as interested in the benefits of diet and exercise, complaining, quote, It is most shocking that physicians of our time do not care to know the regimen of health because they do not consider it lucrative, whereas they are quite concerned in the treatment of diseases. Medieval doctors, it seems, were largely content to let monks, knights, and even the peasantry take the lead on physical fitness. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you'd like to know how people stayed fit during the Renaissance period, please watch our sequel video about that. And please don't forget to like and subscribe for more content. If you'd like to know more about these exercises in even greater depth and how they are done, please consider supporting us on Patreon, a link to which can be found in the video description below. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.